You've made it very easy for me this morning. All I have to do is look to one side. It's good for us to be brought in together. It helps our singing, helps our fellowship with each other. And we're so grateful that you did participate on this uh, very nasty morning, isn't it? But I still want to say, good morning, church. We are very happy to be here. What a blessing to be one of God's children. How blessed it is to be in his kingdom, the church. Yesterday we had a wonderful experience as well as uh, many of us went to feed our, my starving children. And uh, we've done that before. And it's just a great church activity. And uh, those who went, I know, were blessed in their going. Here in our scripture reading this morning, we are reminded that the Apostle Thomas was not present when previously Jesus showed himself alive to the other apostles. And yet Thomas knew that a crucifixion such as the one that Jesus endured, would show prints, is what our text says. We would call them scars. They would show prints on the body of a living Jesus. Why was it then that Jesus had prints or scars in his hands and in his side? Well, of course, because he was crucified. But why was he crucified? He was crucified for you and for me because of the sins that we have done. He was placed upon that cross and suffered what he did. No, not to any son sins that he had done, but our sins. And it left scars in his body. This reminds us of the fact that sin always has consequences. Sin will always scar its victim. We don't like to think about that. In fact, maybe we refuse to think about that. Or maybe we just simply deny it. But the Bible clearly teaches us such to be the case. Evidently, Doubting Thomas knew this truth, or else he wouldn't have asked for them. We can call him Doubting Thomas if we want to, but he didn't doubt what the crucifixion would do to the body of Christ. Brethren, sin is deceitful. Not only does sin leave scars with people, permanent scars, but it also lies. You see, sin wears a mask. It promises everything, but never delivers on what it promises. It deceives. It lies. It hides what really is. We're reminded of the proverb of the wise man of chapter 14 and verse 12, which says there is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. What does sin cause? Death, that's right. Spiritual separation from God. We consider a way that we go to go. It is not God's way. It seems right to us. But it turns out to be wrong. Why? Because we're deceived. Satan, after all, deceived Mother Eve. What happened when she allowed herself to be, to be deceived? She sinned, didn't she? Let's look at the account. I know we've read Genesis 3 many times, but it wouldn't hurt for us to read it again because I'm afraid sometimes we miss the point. 
Beginning with verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has, has God said indeed, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Contradicted what God said, right? What is Satan doing? He's lying to her, isn't he? He's trying to deceive her. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's what he promised. Is that exactly what she got? Was it what she really wanted? (laughs) So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And you read on down in verse 16, it says, God talking about the consequences of what the woman has done. He says to her, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Had she planned on that? Not at all. Did Satan tell her about those consequences? No. But sin always has consequences attached to it. Again, we read concerning her in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. It says, For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. Who deceived? Eve. Satan did. And he says, But the woman being deceived fell into transgression. What's another word for transgression? Sin. That's right. That's exactly what happened to her. And what was the consequence? We just read it back in Genesis chapter 3, didn't we? Of all the consequences of what she had done. What does sin do? Leads Are we not suffering the consequences of her sins today? Satan said that wouldn't happen. You know, our youth are very inexperienced and vulnerable. We can say that to our youth. But you know, we were all young ourselves, weren't we? And what were we? Inexperienced, invulnerable. Parents know that. And so they want to protect their kids. Protect their kids from what? Sin. What do they want to protect their kids from sin besides disobeying God? They don't want their lives scarred permanently. Because of the consequences of doing what they were not supposed to do. And so loving parents protect their children. We know they're going to make mistakes. But as a parent, we're praying to God that the mistakes that they make won't be so deep and destroying. We don't want them to make any, but they will. You see, even adults believe that they can sin and get away with it. Do we ever get away with our sins? So I did something that nobody else knows about. I've been able to hide it for 30 or 40 years. In fact, my spouse doesn't even know it. But you know it, don't you? How is that affecting you? You're trying to hide it still, aren't you? 
Why is that the case? Because sin leaves scars. And I'm sure we all have scars. One way or the other in our lives. You know, we've been having a wonderful study with uh, Brother Shiresh Ramazetti on Sunday morning. Boy, I wish there were more in that class because we've been studying the Old Testament scriptures. And specifically, we've been looking at Israel taking possession of the promised land. A lot of people don't think that we need to be studying that, but we ought to be studying that. But we are reminded that when Reuben and Gad came to the promised land, that some years before, actually it was 40 years ago, they came to a place called Kadesh Berea, as all the children of Israel did. And remember, they sent over there the spies to spy out the land. And all but two brought back an evil report concerning the land. And God would not allow them to enter in because of unbelief. And so for 40 years, you know the story, they wandered in the wilderness. Now they're ready to take the land after 40 years. And they come to the Jordan River. And both the tribe of Reuben and Gad realize that their inheritance is on the east side of the river. They don't have to cross the river to receive their inheritance. And so they're ready to settle down. They're not going to help the other tribes get their possession once they had had theirs. It's interesting to read uh, Moses' rebuke of these tribes. Beginning with verse 5, they said, Therefore they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let us let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us over the Jordan. And Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? Now why will you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord has given them? Isn't it interesting that the, their question starts out, if we have found favor in your sight. Was God pleased with that request? Not at all, was he? Are you going to sit here while your brethren go to war to get their possession when they have already helped you get yours? Sense of fairness here, isn't it? And then we read on in the same chapter these words from Moses. It says, Then Moses said to them, If you do this thing, if you arm yourselves before the Lord for the war, in other, you, or in other words, you go over and you help your brethren, and all your armed men cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven out his enemies from before him, and the land is sub subdued before the Lord, then afterward you may return and be blameless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But then notice, but if you do not do so, then take note, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure that your sin will find you out. Your sin will find you out. It's ever present before you. You know, think about the consequences of Israel going over there and doing, and they subdue it without the help of these two tribes. From that point on, those two tribes would be reminded that they did not help their brethren. That would be a permanent scar, wouldn't it? And I'm sure the other tribes wouldn't let them forget it either. What are we to remember from this? Sin leaves scars. It always leaves scars. The ancient Israelites had to learn that bitter lesson in the wilderness. 
because of their hardness of heart, Israel tested God. Now I want you to note the New Testament reference to this in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial, in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, he said. Think about that. This is after 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, what's well, called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What does sin do? It deceives us. And what happens when we are deceived? Our hearts are hardened. We're going to talk about that this morning as well. And then he goes on to say, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Well, it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in the rebellion. Those people made some bad choices. And there were consequences that happened to them. They were testing God, and we saw this morning in Bible class, didn't we? that God tested them and did not drive all the inhabitants out of the land because of their disobedience. And what were those inhabitants to them? Thorns in their side. What do those thorns leave? Scars. They suffered for generations and generations because of their unfaithfulness to God. But Moses, even as a young man, made the right choice. We read, for instance, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24, by faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. You know what M Moses did for himself in making that decision? He saved himself from a lot of scarring. Oh, there were some. After all, he did kill the Egyptian, didn't he? But we have examples both of people who disobeyed God and those who obeyed God. Young people, and I speak to all of us, you know, we have people that have been in the church 30 or 40 years engaged in activities that they know it are not right. And they're only deceiving themselves that God is going to overlook these things. Not only do, does sin deceive us, lies to us, but it also has a way of searing the conscience. We just mentioned that, didn't we, concerning ancient Israel in Hebrews chapter 3. It leads right up to this. So we'll go, to there. we'll go there next. You know, foolish people play with sin. They think they can sin and get away with it, and sometimes they say, I got away with it. 
but they are ignorant of what sin has done to them personally. That's the real tragedy of the whole matter. So concerned about what other people will think, they forget about themselves and how they feel about themselves. A person will say, I will return to the Lord after I have had a good time in life. I'm going to have some fun before I die. I once knew a, a woman who said that to her husband. He was a fellow gospel preacher. They divorced because she wanted to have some fun before she died. And she died at the age of 58. I think she always had the intention of coming back to the Lord. But she knew she was dying. But she had been caught up in this so long that even her ex-husband tried to reach out to her. For she had remarried. Other Christians tried to reach out to her. And she could not be reached. She would not repent. What had happened? Not only was she, had she been deceived, her conscience was now seared so that the word of God, the exhortation of fellow Christians, could not reach her. There are other people in the church who will say, God is loving. He will forgive me as I deliberately sin against him. And yes, God will forgive us if we repent. God is ver very merciful, merciful. He's willing to repent. He will want us to do what's right. And he will forgive us. But even if he forgives, he forgives us, the consequences may still remain. What's the principle behind this? Sin leaves scars. Sin leaves scars. Consequences. I suppose there are thousands of people incarcerated in this country today who through various prison ministries and so on have learned the gospel, have believed in Jesus, obeyed the gospel. But guess what? They're still in prison. They are still suffering the consequences of their sins. Why? Because sin leaves scars. And we do not want those scars. You see, when we learn to live with sin so that sin no longer affects our conscience, our conscience has become seared or scarred. You know, you know the effect of scarred material, skin, can't feel anything anymore. The Apostle Paul talked to Timothy about that in 1 Timothy 4, beginning with verse 1. Now the Spirit express, uh, expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. We know what that means, don't we? Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Here they know God's word. They believe God's word. They know God's word. But their conscience is seared and allows them to continue in sin. 
terrible thing when the conscience is destroyed that way, where it has no feeling at all. This past week, our oldest had back surgery. We all know that. By the way, we're appreciative of your prayers and your and your concern and your asking about how he's doing. Well, he's doing well. Uh, he's he's with us today. He's leading our singing this morning. And that's after having surgery on Thursday. That's pretty amazing that that can be done nowadays. But do you know that surgery took a little bit longer than they had planned? Because he had had the same surgery before, and the surgeon encountered what? Scar tissue. And he had to work around that, didn't he? That's the way sin is. Sin leaves scars. And scars make it very difficult for us to live in life. Not that we can't. It just makes it all that more difficult to do so. You see, when we compromise on truth and morals, things that once bothered us no longer bother us any longer. You may be somebody that's been involved in an immoral relationship. Maybe sex out of marriage. You know all your life that that has been wrong, but you've been involved in it. And now you can justify yourself and say, well, it doesn't bother me anymore. Can, I, can you think of anything that would have a worse consequence on somebody than that? That that would not bother them anymore? In Proverbs chapter 30, beginning with verse 9, 19, the wise man wrote, the way of an eagle in the air, the way of the serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a virgin. This is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have no wickedness. What is she doing? She's lying to herself, isn't she? And now her adultery does not affect her any longer. If you want to have a really good uh, study of this, go back to chapter 7. Uh, Brother Bergstrom said that he went through this with the young people just recently. Well, it's not just young people that need to know this. Look at what he has to say in verse 17 of chapter 7. Here's what the adulterous woman says. She says, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home on the appointed day. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the uh, correction of the stocks till an arrow struck his, uh, struck his liver. You need to understand the thinking of the ancients here. You know, when they opened up uh, a body or if somebody was injured and they can see all the functions of the body, they knew what the uh, stomach did, they could see what the lungs were doing, the heart was doing. Here you have this big organ and they can't figure out what it's for. So they thought it was the very center of life. And that's why it's called the liver. We, we call it the liver. You see? They didn't know what else to, to do with And so the wise man says, it strikes him right where he lives. <laughs> the very center of what they considered to be of life. And it says, as we, as we read on, as a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost him his life. 
So he's all caught up into this. He didn't think anybody would know and so on. And it all comes out and it cost him his life. He couldn't figure that out. That's the way sin plays with us. And even if he wasn't caught by the woman's husband, he will always know what he has done, hasn't he? Why is that? Because sin leaves scars. I want to hear it. Scars. Sin leaves scars. Over in Jeremiah chapter 6, we read of certain people that can no longer even be ashamed of what they do. And this is what Jeremiah the prophet writes. It says, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No. They were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. You know, people can be so hardened by sin. Their consciences can be so seared that when something that is ugly and inappropriate and sinful comes along, it doesn't even bother them. They can't even blush. I'm not ashamed to say that when I married, I married a blushing bride. And I think that's what men want. A bride like that. Not the adulterous woman, not the loose woman. See, sin leaves scars. Several years ago, there was a study done with our young people. Kathy Martinelli may have been involved in this. Talking about uh, girls and what young girls might do on dates and so on and we come up they come under peer pressure and they want them to do the same type of immoral activity that they are doing why, 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 why would it ever make any difference whether they did or not because they already know that they're doing wrong and they just want you to be on their side doing wrong And so they will criticize the girl that tries to remain chaste, waiting till she is married, until she gives herself to her husband. And I remember in that movie, the girl that was being criticized, the girl that was trying to keep herself pure, said to those who were trying to influence or do do wrong, she said, yes, It's true. I could become like you, but you can never become like me. Why is that? Sin leaves scars. And she'll always know that. Someday she may marry. And she'll try to hide that from her husband. Or the husband may be trying to hide that from his wife. And maybe all the years that they've lived together, till death, the other partner doesn't know what went on. But the one who did it does. And it will always bother them. Because sin leaves scars. Oh, yes, indeed. As we bring our study to a close this morning, I would remind us that Jesus indeed provided the evidence that Thomas demanded of him. Now, eight days later, Jesus showed to him his scars that he demanded. 
Let's, why don't we read that from John's Gospel in John chapter 20, beginning with verse 26. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus said, the doors being shut. Uh, Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. What can we take away from this? The person who is blessed is not the person who has to, has to experience these things, even if they be the scars of Jesus. The person who is blessed is the one who believes the report and knows. There are a lot of things we can experience in life, a lot of things that are not good, we want to avoid those that are not good, those that are sinful. Why? Because sin leaves scars. If you want to define a good and successful life, let me put this in your thoughts. A person who lives a good life before God is the one who has the least amount of regrets possible. Right there. I did right. I did not do wrong because I'm not having to deal with the scars of sin in my life. Jesus tells us that we are more blessed who do not see, but we do believe. As we mentioned before, our God is a gracious God. He knows that what sin does to us. He knows sometimes we don't believe what he tells us, and then we turn around and we suffer the consequences. He loves us. He is merciful to us. If we will repent, if we will turn away from our sins can be forgiven. But the scars remain. They'll always be there. Just as they were with the Apostle Paul. And his scars came from doing right. Preaching the gospel. Because there are consequences to our actions. And so what we want to do is to accept God's gracious invitation. Just as he offered to Israel in the Old Testament, even as we've been reading this morning from the book of Hebrews that is addressed to Jewish Christians who are on the verge of reverting back to Judaism. And they've already started making those moves. The apostle is trying to get them to stop. The writer that there and consider their ways. Here's what we've read already from chapter 3 of Hebrews. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Hold on. Do not be deceived by sin. Don't allow your hearts to become hardened. He says, we are to remind one another. We are to exhort one another. And incidentally, that is something that uh, is a function also of shepherds. 
because people are suffering with sin. You know, have you, have you ever get to thinking about the Apostle Paul when he was Saul of Tarsus? And how he had persecuted Christians, even consenting to their, to their death, such as Stephen, going to their houses, taking them out to imprison them, and having them put to death because they were Christians. And he found out the truth, didn't he? And God was good to him. God called him to be an apostle. God forgave him of his sins, placed him in his kingdom. Did he ever forget what he had done previously in his life? But God forgave him. Yes, God forgave him. But he was having trouble forgetting what he had done. Why was that? Because sin leaves scars. What is sin doing to you this morning? Is it hardening your heart? Has it already hardened your heart? Is your heart seared? It's going to be very difficult to turn around now, isn't it? But you can. God says, I'll help you. I'm ready to assist you. I will forgive you. I'll help you make things right in your life. No, I can't do anything about the scars. But I can put you in a right relationship with me, both now and for eternity. What is your desire? What do you want to see happen with your life? If you're not a child of God, that's where we need to make a change right there. You become a child of God through faith, repentance, confessing Christ, and, and in baptism unto the remission of our sins. God does forgive us. But you may be a child of God, as most people are this morning. But you're dealing with sin and you're not dealing with it right because it's hardening your heart even more and more. And you are not in a right relationship with God, and you know it. And God wants you to make it right. Will you do that through prayer and repentance? Whatever your need may be, we encourage you to come as together we stand and sing.